We're going to talk about taking care of ourselves and our clients when we do nails. And we've already learned in this unit that we use a lot of chemicals and a lot of equipment that can draw first blood. So uh, we don't want to get all alarmed about it. As long as we're taking care of ourselves, we don't have to worry about anything. But if we don't take care of ourselves and use these chemicals and equipment and all safely, then we do uh, have something to worry about. If you notice when you set your table up, you've got a lot of different chemicals on there, and it's things that a lot of us have used since we were teenagers, so we don't think about them being dangerous. But we're looking at eight to ten hours a day now, breathing the fumes of them, putting them on, you know, the uh, chance of them coming in contact with our skin. So some of those products that are full of chemicals are nail polish and nail polish remover. You remember when we was in manicure and we were talking about nail polish remover, how it dried out the skin and the nails if we used it excessively. We have our liquids and powders for acrylic nails, our primer for acrylic nails, and we've done a little discussion about primers would cause chemical burns, and it would also cause the nail bed to burn. Temporary dehydrators, and that's like your chip skip or your bond aid that is a part of your uh, primer system for OPI. You like your gel nail supplies, your no light gels and activators, cuticle oils and creams, and your adhesives for fabric wraps. We also have the adhesives for um, nail tips. We can use all of these and they can be very safe, but every one of them can be dangerous if used incorrectly. Coming in contact with a chemical will not harm you, but overexposure is the danger that we want to avoid. Overexposure for, for long periods causes most of the problems. So we need to know how we can tell if we're becoming overexposed. Our body's going to give us some early warning signs. Some of these are rash and other skin irritations, lightheadedness, insomnia, runny nose, sore dry throat, watery eyes, tingling toes, fatigue, irritability, sluggishness, and breathing problems. But you know, I pick out any three or four of them. I feel that every afternoon at the end of the day. So we feel like it's kind of normal, but we do need to watch out for it if we're using a lot of chemicals. You don't have to worry about these things once you get these uh, signals. You just start avoiding what is causing the problems. And usually there's no long-term effects. Working correctly and safely will eliminate the side effects and allow us to work comfortably and safely. So the first thing we need to do is learn about our chemicals. Now this is not our first um, talk about MSDS sheets. They are vitally important that we have them on each chemical, and that can be because of an overdose or overexposure. But it gives us a lot of information, and we're going to go over that in a moment. But the United States government requires that product manufacturers make these MSDS sheets available to people who use their products. There's some basic information that must be on there. So we can go back and thank our government for this when they mandated OSHA that keeps every chemical company in line to notify us about what the dangers may be. These MSDS sheets must be filed in a conspicuous, accessible location at all times, and y'all know ours are right back there in the dispensary where our chemicals are. While looking at the MSDS sheet, you're going to discover that there is no standard format, meaning that at different companies you go about it in a different way. As a matter of fact, I was having the headache with some of mine yesterday, this one company numbered theirs and they never put a product name on the first MSDS sheet. They put the chemical name and then the number up in the corner and several of their products would have the same number so I had to cross reference mine to get it straightened out but I still got the information but I just went and wrote in the name brands on those you know so I don't have to run look at 099 and then go hunt it up and see if that's the product or whatever. Each MSDS sheet must contain the following information. The identity of the chemicals that would present physical or chemical hazards. The physical hazards from it, you learn about how the product reacts with other chemicals. Is there a potential for explosion, fire hazard, how easily they evaporate, and the health hazards, and we certainly want to know about the health hazards. You learn the signs and symptoms of overexposure, illnesses that might be caused by the product, 
and also existing medical conditions that we have that may be made worse. It's also information concerning overexposure on the skin or if it gets in the eyes or the respiratory system, as well as problems caused if the product is accidentally swallowed. Both the short and long-term health effects of overexposure are listed. And I want to go back to this about the eyes. If you wear contacts, the salon is not the place for contacts. I know they look better. But a lot of these vapors get behind contact lenses. It will etch the lenses, which messes up your contacts. But it also holds it right to your eye. Not a good thing. It also tells us the primary routes of entry into the body that this chemical might go in. So it explains how the product's ingredients may enter your body. Usually these chemicals are going to gain entry through the skin, the mouth, or the lungs. The MSDS will warn you of any such risk so that you can prevent overexposure. You know, some substances coming in contact with our skin, if it comes in contact 25 times a day, is not going to be a problem. Another may be a problem if it comes in contact with our skin two or three times in a day. Permissible exposure limits will be on the MSDS. It must provide recommended safe limits in the air to prevent overexposure by inhaling them. We're sitting right there when we're working with nail products and we're breathing in the whole time. Carcinogen hazard of the chemical. Information about whether any ingredient that is over one-tenth of a percent is suspected of causing cancer, and it must tell us that. Precautions and handling procedures, and that's another reason we want it right there in the salon, but in the school, I have to turn a copy of every MSDS over to the maintenance <coughs> department because they're over custodians, and if we were to have a big chemical spill, who's going to come clean it up? The custodians, and they have a right to know what's going on, too. So the precautions and handling procedures gives us tips on safe handling of the product to prevent overexposure and how to properly clean up leaks or spills. Control and protection measures will be on the MSDS sheet that explains how to protect yourself and clients against the potential hazards of the products. The suggested ventilation needed, type of glove and eyewear protection required, and so on. Some types of our acrylic liquids will melt some forms of plastic, so we've got to be real careful about the gloves we use when we're handling them. Also gives us emergency and first aid procedures, what to do in case there is an accident, how to respond in an emergency. This section is one of the most important since it will give information for treating problems. Emergency first aid advice and emergency phone numbers are also given. We have storage and disposal information. You're going to learn the best and safest way to get rid of old or unused products without causing injury to yourself, others, or the environment. Also, how to safely store this. You know, you wouldn't want some of these products stored right next to a stove where a lot of heat is or in a room where you don't have air conditioning. Some additional information which could be included on MSDS is in Emergency phone numbers, most of them are really good if they don't have the CDC on there uh, or the poison control to have a space there for you to fill in your emergency phone number, such as the emergency room of the hospital or 911. Also, the hazard rankings, and it's assigned a number. Zero is the least hazardous, and four is extremely hazardous. Also, the fire control methods. Some chemicals need specific extinguishing methods, and extinguishers are rated A, B, or C, and we need to have the kind that's uh, for all three because we can have electrical, paper, plastic. Um, we wouldn't have a grease fire in here, but we could on the B. We could have the acetone or alcohol, and also C is electrical. Tells us the specific gravity. Now, we're not really interested in that so much, are we? That is the basic weight of the product as it compares with water. The specific gravity of water is 1. If the product in question has a specific gravity rating less than 1, then it means that the chemical will float on top of the water that it may have been thrown in. This allows the product to reignite if it's caught on fire, so water wouldn't do us any good there. How can you get material safety data sheets? 
<clears throat> that's a tricky thing. I'll tell you, a lot of the companies, and I really like this, have been real good to put them out on their website. But once you buy a product, you need to go ahead and figure out how to get one. The next thing you go to, if it's not on the website, is go to your distributor. That means the person you bought it from. If you cannot get it from them, which you are supposed to be able to, then you go to the manufacturer, and that will be on the bottom of the containers or either in the box it came in. So if you buy, like, chemicals with salad, they, they, have the they should have the MSDS, yes. To give to you? To give to you, yes. If they know it's one that's not on the website, or that company doesn't have a website with the information out there, yes, they should. If they can't, then they should be able to give you an 800 number or, or something to contact the manufacturer of it. OSHA Hazard Communication Standard. In addition to requiring all businesses to have MSDS for all chemicals located in or on business property, OSHA mandates that each business fulfill specific requirements regarding training, inventory control, and written policies and procedures for the handling of hazardous materials. Do y'all remember, remember y'all went through decontamination, infection control, and all of that when you first started? That is a requirement. These are clearly outlined in the OSHA ha Hazard Communication Standard CFR 1910.1200. It's available on the website and at their offices located throughout the United States. Training is required to be adequately provided by the employer, specifically addressing 11 issues. Location of written hazard communication training materials for unlimited access at all times, and we have ours right back there and at the door anytime you need it. Location of all the hazardous chemicals in or on business properties. Location of the MSDS material so that you can go to it any time. You haven't got to run hunting instructor down. It's right there for you to put your hands on. Copy of the provisions of the hazard communication standard for unlimited access. Proper steps in the detection and identification of hazardous chemicals present and or the release of those. Location of any possible monitoring information regarding actual real-time employee exposure. Access to information about employee safe working procedures, job safety analysis, this is information and employee protection. That means we've got to have things here and in the salon you should have them. Protective equipment, and that's considered your gloves, your safety glasses, your dust mask, and even in some case, cases the smocks or jackets you wear. Physical location of materials and health hazards relevant to chemicals present. The handling of non-routine tasks safely and the location of all written policies and procedures. When applicable, information necessary to correctly identify chemicals in unmarked or poorly labeled pipes. Information regarding the business's warning labeling MSDS system and any other labeling system used by the company. And then it shows us just a blank MSDS and the information that be on there. And you see in section one is the manufacturer's name. So right off, you would know where you could, you know, contact this manufacturer if need be. And it goes on and gives all the other pertinent information. OSHA also requires that all businesses adopt and enact a written policy to comply with their labeling mandates. Simply stated, all containers having chemicals in them must be clearly labeled. We understand that from uh, sea breeze, barbicide, the different things we used, and we've been over that over and over about. Please label. OSHA also mandates that a complete chemical inventory list be kept for quick reference, and we keep one in our MSDS folder. A written program of policies and procedures must also be developed. Now, I know a beauty shop is not going to go in as far as a school does because we're an educational institute. We're also a state institute. But in the beauty salon, you need to have something because children are going to come in there. There's going to be spills. There's going to be people getting into things they have no business getting into. Or you may even knock some of this over onto that client or splash it in their eyes. So have some type of system in place to address problems that occur. Avoiding overexposure is easy. Now, these others are emergency things, but to us, overexposure is what we're most concerned with for our health. So it's easily to work 
it's easy to work safely. Remember, health hazards are created by overexposure. So what we've got to do is decide how to avoid that overexposure. There's only three ways that these products can enter our body. We can breathe them or inhale them. We can absorb them through our skin. And we can also eat them. And I know a lot of students say, well, I'm, I know better than to eat my products, you know. But there's ways we eat them without realizing, you know, we're having them, not having them for lunch. What are those? Putting your comb in your mouth. How about this? Put your finger in your mouth. We do a lot of things that we don't realize is, you know, our hands are all over the place. So that's what we mean eating them. What about if we keep our coffee cup sitting there on the table while we're filing and got these dusts and chemicals? We're, we're eating it then too, aren't we? If you control these routes of entry, you will greatly lessen the chance of overexposure. Since the first one is we breathe them or inhale them, our ventilation control is one of the most important things. Our ventilation system must remove vapors and dust from the building. And what Georgia has come up with now, and I'm glad they have, is we've got to have an outdoor ventilation system. And what that means is that it goes outdoors. It's not like most of us that have an exhaust over our stoves, where does it go? It goes right up into the attic, which means it can come right back to us. Vented manicures are almost completely ineffective. As a matter of fact, we found out that the vented manicure tables where it's got the vent and the exhaust right in the table, we have a breathing zone that's right here in front of our face. We breathe in and we breathe out in our breathing zone. And what happens with this is most vapors rise. And we've got the ventilation here in our table, so it goes up through our breathing zone. The ventilation brings it right back down through our breathing zone again. So we're getting, not only are they ineffective, we're getting it the second time around. <clears throat> we want to be aware of our breathing zone, too. It's an invisible sphere about the size of a beach ball that sits directly in front of your mouth. Every single breath you take comes from your breathing zone. Your health and safety depends on what occurs in this small area. So that is the reason for ventilation. Excessive inhalation of vapors is a problem for nail technicians. These vapors come from the evaporation of liquids. All liquid nail products evapor evaporate and contribute to the total vapors in the air, even odorless acrylics, wraps, and light-cured gels. The odor is not what bothers us, however. We ventilate to control vapors and dust. So what can we do to lower our exposure? Some of the most effective ways to eliminate vapors are the easiest and least expensive. Did y'all notice when we did um, sculpted nails, I'd keep only one powder open at the time. I cautioned you to lay something over your liquid when you're not using it. All of that, tightly sealed bottles are our best protection because they're not allowed into the air. Using a covered daffa dish or pump to limit the vapors. Avoid using pressurized sprays, and this is like our hairspray cans, and I still love the hairspray out of a can. And we've got some products that dry nail enamel, it comes out of a can, and it does work a little more efficiently, but we're there all day long, and we're spraying and breathing and spraying and breathing, so the best thing is get a little pump bottle. Empty your waste container often. It is one of the best sources of vapors. A local exhaust. The only complete answer to salon vapor and dust control is local exhaust. They are based on a simple concept. They capture the vapors and dust at the source and expel them from your breathing zone. Local exhaust uses an exhaust vent, hose, and tube to capture vapors, dust, and mist. Some even have a movable, and we have ours in the ceiling back there in our nail room, but some of them have like a tube that you can lay on your table to pull it out and pull it on up through, and that would work good. An exhaust system should completely ventilate and replace the air volume in a treatment area four to six times per hour. Fresh air should be brought in through a fresh air intake located at least 25 feet from the exhaust outlets. This is where you run into problems with putting a mail, nail shop in a mall and our place, you know, in a building there's two or three other businesses in. If we're not careful, our exhaust is right next to their intake that brings it back in or their air conditioner. 
For years, we've had a fight back and forth with the ones that work upstairs from this building because we have the same heating and air conditioning unit that they do. And our we had it just a little exhaust, and it went into our ceiling, which meant that their heating and air picked it up and put it in there. And it smelled a whole lot worse up there where they were than it did down here with us because our exhaust was removing it, you know, and then they were getting it. How did they do that then? They just got to make sure they get far enough away from their ventilation system, you know, that you have somebody naturally that's trained to do it to move it far enough away. The way we had to do this one, and it was a real bad thing, we had to take out one of our restrooms because all of these walls around here are underground. This one, we would put it right out on the stairs. There was some discussion about putting a nail area in here, but we would have put it right out on the stairs where people are coming right by all the time. And then on the back side of the bathrooms is the boiler room. So what they did is went through the ceilings and run it outside over there because we don't have individuals in the boiler room very often. So you've just got to find that outlet where it's not going to come in contact with, with people. Although venting to the outside is preferred, it's not always possible. If your salon has no outside access, the vapors and dust can be filtered through a HEPA filter and at least a five-gallon canister packed with activated charcoal. Now, Georgia has said that you cannot do that. You have got to have an outside vent. So that's what, something you want to look at before you open a salon is, do I want to do nails? And that doesn't mean manicures. You can do manicures without the dangers. But if you're going to be doing acrylic nails, then you certainly need to vent outside. Another thing we need to do is prevent overexposure to the dust. Prolonged inhalation of excessive amounts of nail filings are even harmful. What's in those nail filings as we file the nail off? Bacteria, particles. That person's DNA is actually there. Not that nail filings are especially dangerous, but breathing large amounts of any dust is harmful. Our bodies can remove many of the dust, but problems occur only if you continually inhale more than your lungs can handle. Wearing a dust mask can prevent this. Nothing you can buy will do a better job of protecting your lungs against dust. Should we offer it to our client? Yes, we sure should. And a lot of people say, well, she's not going to get overexposed. She's only going to be there 45 minutes or an hour. It doesn't matter if she's going to get overexposed. We don't know what she does, what kind of environment she works in. She may have already been in, in a place where she's inhaling a lot of things she shouldn't be. A dangerous misconception. Many believe that they can tell how safe or dangerous a chemical is by its odor. A chemical smell has absolutely nothing to do with safety. Some very dangerous substances have sweet, pleasant fragrances. Products or ventilation systems that cover up or remove odors will not protect your health. Odors are really our friend. Odors can warn against overexposure danger. Odors are caused when vapors touch sensitive detectors in the nose. After the vapors leave the nose and enter the lungs, their odor is no longer important. You are asking for trouble if you use odor to judge product safety. The same is true for nice smells. Overexposure to nice smelling vapors also can harm you. We want to protect our eyes. What can we get in our eyes that be a problem? Doing nails. The monomer. The monomer. The powder. The powder of polymers. The primer. If the primer is going to cause a little bit of burning through the nail bed, on the nail bed all the way through the nail, what is it going to do if it gets in our eyes? What about our client's eyes? So should we use goggles? What about glue? I was just going to say, I used glue yesterday and it just made my eyes pierce. Right. So it would help a lot if you had on your safety goggles. Accidents involving the eyes are a serious danger in salons. Solvents in the eye can be very painful and can cause severe damage. Primer, wrap monomers, adhesives, phenolic disinfectant solution in the eyes are worse. Remember when we mixed our um, barbicide? which is our disinfectants, what do we put in first? Water. The water. And then we pour the product in because we don't want to take a chance of having that strong chemical on the bottle, bottom and pouring that in and it's splattering it out into our eyes. 
Each of these can cause permanent eye injury or blindness. Imagine what it's like to be blind. It could happen if we're not careful. Always use eye protection when there is the slightest chance that a liquid product can get into your eyes. Eye injuries account for approximately 45% of the cosmetic-related injuries seen in hospital emergency rooms, and many of those are students and salon professionals. Wearing contacts in the salon is risky. Vapors will collect in soft contacts and make them unwearable. Even if you wear safety glasses, vapors are still absorbed. The contaminated lens can etch the surface of the eye and cause permanent damage. Should an accidental splash occur, the liquid will wick under the lens. This will make proper cleaning of the eye more difficult. Some other tips for working safely. Don't smoke in the salon. Why shouldn't we smoke in the salon? All the chemicals we have, but aren't some of them flammable? Suppose we drop that cigarette in. Always avoid skin contact. Never touch any acrylic liquids, wraps, or adhesives, like cured gels to the skin. This is one of the leading causes of service breakdown, lifting, and allergic reactions. Never eat or drink in the salon area. Why? That's how we start eating our products. We said a while ago we would never eat them. Store and eat your lunch in a separate area of the salon. Why shouldn't it be stored where our products are stored? The, the vapors. Always wash your hands before and after eating. I think we know why that is. We've handled other people's hands. We've handled all these chemicals. We've handled the table and things that we had to throw away. Label all containers. Store your products in a cool area. Empty your trash can regularly. We use a closed trash can. Why would we want to empty it regularly? Doesn't that keep the vapors in? When you open it, here it comes again, and if we've removed it, it's not there to bother us. Keep caps on all products and be prepared to handle accidents. The next thing we want to talk about is cumulative trauma disorders. And the main one of these that scares cosmetologists and nail techs alike is carpal tunnel syndrome. A cumulative trauma disorder, or CTD, is also known as repetitive motion disorder. CTDs are the fastest growing type of injury for all occupation. CTDs cause painful and crippling illness that may become permanent if not treated. Carpal tunnel syndrome is the most common CTD. This illness affects the hands and wrists of many nail technicians. The carpal tunnel is a small passage in the wrist bone that carries the nerve from the fingers to the arm. Repetitive motions can create damaging pressure on the nerve. Injury is usually caused by repetitive motion, such as filing nails. The uh, electric drills and all they use are even worse because it aggravates it, keeps it bouncing and vibrating all the time. The pain and numbness often spread into the arms and fingers. If ignored, the situation usually becomes worse. Continued injury can permanently danger, damage the nerve. Other things can cause CTDs. Sitting or working in the same position, awkward reaching, stretching, or twisting may damage the carpal tunnel or similar nerves in the neck and back. Let me tell you all about carpal tunnel. One of the main things to do with it, and I have had carpal tunnel surgery, but I did not have it for carpal tunnel. I had it because I had cysts in my wrists that they had to remove that were growing around my nerves over here. The carpal tunnel is actually right along here. And it's caused from moving them back and forth. If you feel like you're having some problems, go on to the doctor. Everybody avoids going to the doctor because they they think he's going to operate on them. The very first thing they're going to do is put a cuff on you that keeps you from moving your wrist. It goes right through here over your hand and comes up your arm. And you can do hair quite well. I, I'm living proof. When I had my surgery, I had it on Monday morning. I was back at work on Wednesday. They put that same thing back on there after they did the surgery. I come right back to work. I had the use of all my fingers, and they told me to go ahead and use them, just not to lift, you know, until I got straightened out from the surgery. But one of the major things to do is try to keep your wrist from um, motion so much, and I've never thought that this line of work caused mine. I think crocheting caused mine because I'll sit at night and I'll crochet, and I've learned that using that hand brace 
still I can crochet just as well because my fingers was all I needed. I didn't need to move my wrist. So watch your wrist movements. And when every so often, because you're going to use curling irons and brushes and combs and all that, take your hand and put it flat on a table and put weight on it. And do that periodically. And you will notice that that gets rid of a lot of the numbness, relaxes you and loosens you up. I, I like that better than anything. And I do it in my left arm a lot. Some symptoms of CTDs are pain, numbness, aching, stiffness, tingling, weakness, swelling. If you experience any of these symptoms, pay close attention to how you work. In other words, are you wiggling your wrist you know, more than you have to? Report it to the employer immediately. You can usually tell which repetitive motion is causing the pain. It's best to seek medical attention immediately. There are many things nail technicians can do to avoid CTDs. Always sit in a natural, unstrained position. Don't hunch over the client's nails and change your position often. Stretch frequently every 20 to 30 minutes, even if only for a few seconds. Avoid using tools that vibrate excessively. Hold your wrists straight and avoid bending them while filing or using a brush. Stop work and stretch or shake out your hands. Do frequent strengthening exercises. Most importantly, take your time. Rushing through a service is hard on you and it's hard on the client's nails. And these electric drills, I know we live in the fast food era, but these electric drills that you get through with are digging into their natural nails. So it's not good for you to be holding them all day. It's not good for them to have them used on them. Quality is more important than speed. Do not sacrifice your health and your client's nails by rushing through a nail service. Raise your prices. Don't do as many clients. Ice and ibuprofen or aspirin will help ease the pain, but if you think you have a CTD, see a doctor, and see a doctor just as soon as you feel like you have it. So they can go ahead and put a, a wrist brace on you. Questions? Are we ready to work safely?